I was told when I started that I couldn't be a director because I was a woman. And I've been directing now for many years, but certainly not as frequently as I would have had I been a man. I was going into meetings on projects with people as a feature director who had worked with Academy Award nominated actors. So I should have been taken seriously in these meetings, but I wasn't. It was always a sense of, can you really do this? That a man could do it better. People would say things to me like, your movie would have gotten a bigger distribution deal had you been a man. A lot of people have crazy prejudice that we can't direct action movies, even though we might have grown up doing sports our whole lives and taking all kinds of boxing and fight classes. You can't actually look at a man and say, he probably doesn't know how to cook. And you can't look at a woman and say, she probably knows nothing about sports. We're not in the 19th century. <laughs> Not every woman director is capable of directing every movie. Not every male director is capable of directing every movie. We all have a different skill set to bring to the job, but the job is completely gender neutral. You ask any man who has a wonderful career, who loves what they're doing, what would happen if somebody told you you can't do that because you have the wrong genitals? I mean, it's, 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 it's absurd. We knew that there was something wrong, but we didn't know it was that bad, but it was that bad. And so the next question was, what are we going to do about this? By the time you get into the DGA, you've long been a director. You know, you're not just coming off the street. They're not recruiting new talent from out of nowhere. Sadly, part of the issue for women is that we are lumped into a category of diversity. And so the numbers dwindle because half or even more than half of those jobs go to men of diversity instead of just women. In the DGA studio uh, diversity agreements, ethnic minority men and women of all ethnicities are clumped together in one category. So when showrunners or studio execs feel that in order to comply with DGA studio diversity agreements, they have to hire an ethnic minority man or a woman, invariably they hire a man, an ethnic minority man. So I proposed that we create a double mandate system that instead of having one diversity program, we would have two separate diversity programs. One of the diversity programs would include women of all ethnicities, and the other group would include ethnic minority people of both genders. In this way, women of color would qualify for both employment pools. So the studios, showrunners, and executives would ha have to hire women. They wouldn't be able to just pull ethnic minority men out of the diversity pool. They'd have to hire women. And they would also have to hire ethnic minority people. I didn't write it as if we want to make a law. I just said we want this concept to be discussed more in depth. And even that didn't pass. 
one of the most powerful administrators in the Directors Guild told a really close friend of mine, if the Guild had a blacklist, Maria Geis would be on it. This was the spring of 1979, which was the Pleistocene age when dinosaurs were still roaming in Hollywood, and I mean that literally and metaphorically at the same time. I came here from New York um, and was invited to a meeting, a large meeting with a lot of women. We said, are you working? Are you working? Are you working? And everyone said no. We all met every Saturday morning in my dining room with all this data on the table. Some of these piles were this big. And it took a year for us to finally come to the number of how many women were working and how many women weren't working. And the number that became clear was that of all the assignments in both television and motion pictures, one half of 1% of all those jobs were going to women. It did come up, well, What's going to happen? You know, we can, maybe we'll never work again. And so then we realize, what do we have to lose? We're not working now. Between 1979 or 80, in 1995, the statistics jumped from one half of 1% to 16% in television. They never, they never went that high in film. They only went up to 3% or 5%. In fact, that's where they are right now. Now, if those statistics kept going up at that rate, by now, we should be ha having about between 30 and 35% of all television jobs should be given to women. But that is not happening. In fact, the statistics plateaued out after 1995 and started to go backwards, which means that things have not improved in the past 20 years. How is that possible? The first director of any narrative film was a woman, Alice Guy Blaché. So when people tell you you shouldn't be directing because you're a woman, what? We grew up to be I had been observing on Law and Order hundreds and hundreds of hours I observed and they would never ever give me a job and I asked why is it that women can't get jobs I directed two feature films why couldn't I get an episode of television and they said it's a Gordian knot it's just a conundrum we've all fought for it we've all talked about it and we just don't think anything can be done about it when movies didn't make money, they said, well, we tried a woman, and it didn't work out. Imagine if they tried that with one guy. We tried a guy, that didn't work. So now we're gonna go to what? Aliens? <laughs> the women aren't making as much money, so they're the first people dropped off the agent's slate, so if you don't have an agent, you don't get the job. Clearly, if people still think we can't make money, you know, we have to talk about things that, you know, how much money Fifty Shades did, how much money Frozen did. And Catherine Hardwick turned the young adult genre into a lucrative genre. I'm Catherine Hardwick, and I directed Twilight. Close your eyes. And nobody knew that it would be as big as it would be because we were told YA book for girls like Sisterhood of the Traveling Pants. That's going to max out at like $28 million. That's all this movie will ever make. There's not a big enough audience for it. So they kept cutting the action sequences down. Cut it down, cut it down, cut the visual effects down till we could make it for the budget they wanted to make. And then of course, opening weekend, we made you know, $400 million. Can we stop being surprised? Would it be okay to stop being surprised? It's like when you hear you know, a black person speak and you say you're so articulate, that's how insulting it is. You can't keep saying to us, wow, you can make movies that are actually successful. Are you insane? 
After Twilight, people were excited about Divergent. People were excited about Hunger Games. In fact, even people were inspired to write those books, probably with the success of Twilight. So I think it's, it's shown that there is a desire, that there is an audience, that if you see a brave, you know, badass girl out there, that people will go see the movie. It's disappointing that even though you know, a female director directed the first Twilight, did the whole cast set the whole look. Not one of the other Twilights, or The Hunger Games, or Divergent, even though they're all writ books written by women, starring a woman, not one of them has been directed by a woman. We're having a huge argument right now. If women can direct these big pictures, of course they can. Oh. In the world of big, big budget, Marvel and DC movies, there hasn't really been a woman. So there was pressure of that one woman who's going to all guide us there. I made the movie Punisher Warzone. <laughs> Directors have to have a vision and they have to stick with that. You can't be wishy-washy about things, you have to be decisive. I've actually had executives say things to me like, oh, we're never hiring her again. She cannot make a decision if her life depended on it. So that gave me a message of if you're soft-spoken and you're trying to get along with everybody, that's not what they want in a director. Yet at the same time, I remember precisely a development executive saying to me, we really want the Punisher in a muscled-out car flying into a house and me saying, absolutely not. That was me being difficult. And this is another one of those code words where like, okay, how exactly would you like me to be decisive and stick to my vision and be strong about what I want and yet not upset anybody? Please give me the secret to that. It's a fail fail situation. I see this in film schools where, you know, girls will direct a scene and then one of the guys will say, well, I don't think that's gonna work. And you will see that she will not quite know how to react to it. She will say, well, I still want to do it this way. And he will go on and say, ah, but it doesn't make sense. When she then becomes stronger, you will hear the whispers of bitch going through the whole room. I've been the first woman to direct on TV shows. And I found there were people who really couldn't look at a woman in the eye and take orders from a woman. Now, there's other ways of being a director because, let's face it, there are all kinds, shapes, and sizes of male directors. I ended up now sponsoring the largest amount of research ever done on gender in media, covering over a 20-year span, and the results are appalling for every one female character, there are three male characters. In crowd scenes, there's only 17% female characters, which is pretty horrifying. We found that if there's a female director or writer, the percentage of female characters on screen goes up 10%. So it has an impact on what we see on screen. The reason I've focused on what happens in front of the camera is because I feel that we're training people from the very beginning, from when they're a little toddler, to see women as less important and less competent. We're not seeing women in leadership positions, so therefore we're not seeing it in real life. One interesting example is that we studied the occupations of all female characters in film and TV, and on TV, there are so many female forensic scientists. How'd you find her wheels? Because of CSI and those shows, that colleges are scrambling to keep up with the number of women who want to study forensic science because they've seen it, right? And they say, hey, that looks great. I could do that. Well, we're not seeing women directing uh, films. We're also not seeing female directors on screen. We're just not seeing enough role models that would make you say, I could be that. So it's a huge, huge problem. And, and that's why our motto is, if they see it, they can be it, because you have to see it. I was president of the Directors Guild and the only, so far, female president of the Directors Guild in its many years of being in existence.
So what happened is I got tapped, a former president, and says, you know, you're going to be president one day. So I said, well, you know, I should run now. Then they said, oh, you know, so-and-so is older than you. We should let him be president first. So why don't you step aside? We'll let him be president first. And then four years later, oh, so-and-so should run and you should step aside. I mean, they told me things like, oh, you're too young to be president. And then I said, well, how old were you when you were president? And they were younger than I was at the time when they said that. They said, well, you have to learn to play golf. You have to schmooze with us in the bar and talk about sports and, you know, and all this stuff. I found out later, these are the kinds of things that in corporations they tell women. I mean, I really wondered about this. I was at a panel that was a joint director's guild and writer's guild. There was a lot of showrunners in the audience and the conversation got around to how many times somebody would say, oh, yeah, no, we had a, we had a woman on our staff. Well, no, we had a woman director. For some bizarre reason, when we're half the population, this idea that when you have one or two, you've, you're done, you've done your job. I can vouch for the fact that there are over 1,200 trained women directors, professional, experienced women directors, Directors Guild members who are not working. And every year that goes by that they're not working, their careers are dinged by the fact that they're not working. When you dig into the pool of women directors, it's a very shallow pool. The Most of the women in that pool are movie stars or the daughters of movie moguls or producers or something. You're, for the most part, not going for women who have been through film school and made award-winning films and so forth. Those women get forgotten. Their names don't appear on any list that, that producers can see. They don't have any way of knowing who those women are or how they can access them. And the Directors Guild does this terrible thing of maintaining this diversity list. You have to have directed within the last 18 months to be on this list. So when a, a production company, a producer, or a showrunner wants to hire a woman director of any ethnicity, they call the DGA and they get this list and they get the same list over and over again. There are about 27 women who are directing over and over and over again. So if the producers call uh, the agents for those women and they find they're all booked up, which they are because they're, going to get, they're getting all the work, then they move on to men because there's no other list to pull from. And those are lucrative, glamorous, good jobs. The DGA Diversity Task Force is a very important organization within the Guild. Now the Diversity Task Force is made up of DGA directors and they are there to oversee compliance of the DGA Studio Diversity Agreements. And they're also actively seeking open assignments on TV shows at those same studios. You can imagine what an incredible conflict of interest this is. It's like having a police force that you're asking to go and police a corporation where they're also employed. But those women in that little pool don't want any women to come in. It's like the economy of scarcity. In fact, a young woman director went up to one of the most highly employed women directors in television and asked her if she would give her a hand getting into TV directing. She said, why would I do that for you? You'll only be competing for jobs against me. As soon as I made Twilight, I would have thought it would be a lot easier because I could prove that I made $400 million for a studio on a, on a $37 million budget and it spawned a huge franchise and all the other franchises similar to it. But it was not easy for me after that. In fact, it was just as difficult. And my next movie, I got paid less. I'm in a situation right now where I've written a screenplay that a significant producer wants to produce and a significant actor wants to star in. Women who are known as the 
foremost feminists in Hollywood as producers and their belief system is that they cannot get a movie made with a woman director attached. That's their belief system. I've spent every single day of these last two and a half years solely full-time dedicated to this project. This is the movie that I was put on the planet to direct. What do I do? What do I do? Do I say, do I l allow my moral outrage to bubble up and say, how dare you? Or do I say, this has been a 30 year struggle and do I take advantage of this opportunity to maybe have a really high profile movie made that I would have written and that I would produce, but I won't direct, someone else will direct. It is so outrageous now to hear this stuff still going on, to hear that people still say, we won't want a woman, we can't hire a woman, a woman couldn't do this. I'm still hearing it. And I was president of the DGA. It doesn't matter what you do, because I happen to be one of those directors. I did all the steps. I did the guyish movies. I did the movie that wasn't a chick flick, and I was nominated for an Oscar, and I had the follow-up feature that won awards. You work hard, you achieve your things, you pay your dues and you go up. But when you keep hitting walls when you shouldn't be hitting walls, it all makes no sense to you anymore. Cut! Right away, guys, let's go again! In the process of this, I've lost myself. And I'm just, like right now, trying to find it again. Like, who am I? Who was I when I got here at 20? If I could go back, I would never go into film business. I, I would have done many, many other things, uh, you know, this is actually going to make me cry because, you know, don't, don't film that. <laughs> it's heartbreaking. If I would meet another 20 year old, I would say run, turn around, go into any other industry. There are a group of us who are basically putting our names out there risking the possibility of getting blacklisted and never working again because we want to change things for the next generation because I want to change things for my nine-year-old daughter and her friends because because I don't want to see this happen again to anybody there's been silence for the last 20 years there's not silence anymore it's amazing anyone who makes noise as that you know they they don't they do and they have 13 percent of the jobs to lose and that's brave to go up and say, I'm sorry, I'm not just interested in myself, I'm interested in the other women who are standing on either side of me. Some men and women feel it isn't gonna change because some people feel it's almost biological, which if you were out there scrambling in the dirt and trying to kill a squirrel to eat it, uh, it would make a difference who could run faster, throw a spear farther, that would all make a difference. We don't live in that world anymore and we've evened the playing field. So the question is, do we have enough inner virtue to do the right thing? Or does this have to be a war where 51% a, a of the population battles to get equal status? Why has not one studio come forward and said that? Not one network, not one production company has come forward and said, we cannot hear it anymore. These stats are horrible. We were put in a volunteer quota. They're waiting until the government does it. And trust me, we are pushing for that. It's not like we're not pushing on all ends. The simple truth is the only thing that's going to change is to hire women. Just hire us. We're really good. I think people are now really catching on and I feel like there is a momentum building to make a difference. The only way it's really gonna change is if people just like make a concerted effort. People with money and power, which is studio executives, and a lot of them are women. If they say, we are gonna have 50% women, let's just go for parity. The public has to get invested, because here is why it does matter. It does matter who tells the stories. The reason you have, you know, only size zero, uh, you know, girls who, who starve themselves to death, or you have 12-year-olds in certain outfits, everything is sexualized, that's because you don't have us behind the camera. So the public should get invested. They make it very simple. I say, don't worry about making more movies, starring a female character. If you do, great. 
forecast me, but let's say the uh, network makes a decision, we're going to hire half women or take them on as interns or apprentices, whatever. I think we will be able to make this change happen, that it's going to snowball. And if we added female characters at the rate we have been over the past 20 years, uh, we'll achieve parity in 700 years. So it's going to be more like seven if I have anything to do with it. If I can somehow get my old self back and, and overcome this and say, look, I'm just going to have to be back to before this happened and like be the person I was when I got here, maybe I'll write another film. I have a disease, a need to tell stories, because I am a director. I am a director. This is what I do. Don't listen to what they say, that you're not good enough, or you can't do it, or you're incompetent, or you're indecisive. It's all a lie. Make your voice heard. That you're mad as hell, and you're not going to take it anymore. You can't take it anymore, or you won't have a career.